brief are in listen only mode. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Bill Brannick from OCE, and welcome to our secondary webinar this evening on exploring digital literacy. I apologize if you hear elephants in the background. That is just my children uh, running around upstairs. Uh, on behalf of the team, I would like to offer you blessings today on Ash Wednesday as we enter a season of reflection, sacrifice, and preparation for our Lord's death and resurrection. Joining us this evening, as always, our tech integration coaches, both Alyssa DeVito and Aaron Hines, are here to be able to assist in our webinar presentation this evening. Alyssa, Aaron, how are you this evening? Hi, everybody. Glad to be here with you. Hi, everybody. Same here. Doing great. And as typical, our agenda uh, is as follows. We'll begin momentarily with a prayer and then uh, talk a bit about Archive Act 48 information, and then it will be the opportunity to be able to introduce uh, our presenter, Kathy, to everyone. So at this time, if I would ask that if we would all quiet ourselves and um, join in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, all who are thirsty, says Jesus, our Lord. Come, all who are weak. Taste the living water that I shall give. Dip your hands in the stream. Refresh body and soul. Drink from it. Depend on it. For this water will never run dry. Come, all who are thirsty, says Jesus, our Lord. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. John Newman, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As a reminder, if you are a returning attendee, or if this is the first time that you've joined us on one of our webinars, uh, our webinar will be recorded and archived on our AOP Tech YouTube channel. Throughout the webinar and the specific times where we have listed for questions and answers, we will allow um, open the floor up publicly to be able to ask a question orally to our presenter this evening. Those questions, if you would um, like to, to have the microphone will be recorded. However, throughout the webinar, uh, Alyssa and Aaron and I will also be in the background checking the, the chat window and the questions box for those questions that you may want to ask privately. Uh, we will have an opportunity to be able to, to chat with you one-on-one -on -one and be able to provide any specific answers to you. And also we'll have the opportunity to highlight any of those questions that may have been brought up in the questions window um, during our Q&A period times. Um, names will not be involved uh, with those <clears throat> questions that are brought up in the questions window uh, in regards to the archive purpose. We are now offering Act 48 credit. Uh, for our participants, Act 48 credit is a separate registration through Courseware, and to be able to receive Act 48 credit, you must attend both the March and April webinars and uh, complete the, uh, the webinars in entirety as well as the follow-up surveys through the Office uh, of Catholic Education. Uh, we do not control the, the surveys themselves. Those are taken care of from Sister Edwards' office, but we are happy to be able to answer any questions that we can in regards to Act 48 credit. And at this time, I'm thrilled once again to be able to introduce our featured presenter, Ms. Kathy Zimborski. Uh, Kathy is the ELA chair, Archbishop Ryan, and she has been uh, in service to the Archdiocese of Philadelphia for over 25 years and at Ryan for over 20 years. Kathy also spent six years at St. Catherine of Siena, and she is a Google certified educator. As well, Kathy has a great connection um, and wonderful network through the Penn Literacy Network and is a featured blogger there. Um, you will be able to, to have a direct click to Kathy's uh, blog itself, which is listed there, there, and you will also receive follow-up resources to the webinar, which will be sent out tomorrow, uh, just about this time. And always uh, follow Kathy at Twitter at KSZYM. And Kathy, thanks for joining us this evening. I am going to flip over uh, the presentations over to you in just one minute. And here it comes. Okay, are we there? Uh, not yet. There we go. You okay, got well, thank you. And um, thank you very much for coming tonight, um, for spending some time thinking about uh, what digital literacy is and um, exploring some, some ideas that I hope you'll find interesting. 
What I'd like to do in the first half is I'd like to talk about definitions of digital literacy and really examine what it is and what it is not. And then we'll take a break and when we come back from that, we'll talk a little bit about what digital literacy means for us as educators. So I guess the first thing we have to do is talk about a definition. But before we can define what digital literacy is, I think it begs the question, you know, what is literacy? And that, that's a kind of an interesting way to start to look at things because in my experience, um, when you ask people what literacy is, you really can't get people to agree very, very much on um, a clear and concise definition. Some people think it has to do with the ability to read and write. At the Penn Literacy Network, we talk about things, uh, also Common Core, reading, writing, listening, and speaking. And I thought maybe a global perspective would be interesting. So UNESCO defines literacy as the ability to identify, understand, interpret, create, commu communicate, and compute using printed and written materials associated with uh, different contexts. So before we even put the digital in front of it, we have to think about what literacy is. Um, a little funny story, you may think or you may have heard about the course that we have at Ryan called Digital Literacy. And in fact, some of my colleagues tonight from school were asking me if this was going to be a presentation about that course that they've already seen. And I said no, but it reminded me that when we first developed this course, we called it Literacy 2.0. We thought that was kind of clever and it was like a, a real kitschy name and people would dig it and parents started coming up to school saying, what do you mean? My kid's at a second grade literacy level? So maybe it's hard to come at a definition of literacy straight on. Um, but certainly when they, they got their kids rosters, they were a little confused and a little concerned. Um, and we, we changed the name to digital literacy, which is not the same digital literacy that we're going to talk about tonight, but it is. So <laughs> let's get started with what digital literacy is. Um, if I'm asked for a definition of it, a quick definition, I say it's the ability to basically to read and write online. I'm, I might say to create and curate content online. There's many differing definitions about digital literacy. Alyssa was telling me that ISTE avoids even using the term digital literacy, partly because they want to emphasize that um, digital literacy is part of all areas of the curriculum so that they don't want to segregate it or relegate it to one particular part. They prefer to talk about being digitally literate. Uh, the American Library Association talks about it as the ability to use information and communication technologies. And it talks about finding and evaluating and creating and communicating information that requires um, you know, all kinds of different skills, both cognitive and technical. Um, that's probably the closest definition that at the end when we see this that I would say that I agree with, and I'd be very interested to hear your comments about what your interpretation is of digital literacy. Sometimes people include all the skills that you need to be digitally literate in digital literacy. Like they'll say, oh, you know, you need to be able to use programs or you, you're going to need to be able to keyboard or the ability to do a, a variety of things. Um, I've been in the company of people who think that it's computer skills, like uh, being able to, I don't know, hardwire or something, I, something I'm not good at, I'll tell you that. Um, I have a, a colleague at the Penn Literacy Network who believes that there's no such thing as digital literacy, that all of the skills that are part of what we would define as digital literacy actually come under the umbrella term literacy. I think that's kind of an interesting way of looking at things too because I think that I'll give away a little something right now that 
the key part to digital literacy is the ability to approach anything with a, a critical eye, with critical thinking skills, with a way of interacting with information um, carefully, judiciously, and with the kind of skills that those of us who, um, you know, might be a few years older that we remember all of us learning uh, very carefully in college and in high school and, and even and in grade school as well. Doug Belshaw, Be, Doug Belshaw is a guy who used to work for Mozilla creating badges and he's from I, I want to say England, he might be Australian, I'm sorry I don't exactly remember but it, of course in our world of connection, he's just as close as uh, the next thing you can get online. He has come up with what I think is probably the best definition bar none because what he does is he breaks down eight key elements. He calls them digital literacies and I'd like to spend some time with you going through um, what these digital literacies are. The first one is a cultural literacy, and it's been nicknamed, you know, how to behave online, how to act online. So that carries with it all of the ideas of the things that we probably spend a great deal of our time talking to kids about, you know, how to, how to be safe online, how not to talk to strangers, how to keep your passwords private and not tell everybody your passwords in school just like you give everybody your locker combination, netiquette, um, how to write emails, how to, how to write uh, something that sounds professional and not use lowercase i's. Cultural literacy has an aspect of being able to know the difference between professional and personal use. Um, I think that's something that as teachers we need to model more and be a little more transparent in it. Um, just an aside before we go any further, I've always been of the opinion, and this is not something that comes recommended, but this is my, probably my one big bad, you know, uh, disagreement, is that um, you should have separate personal and professional accounts. I, I don't. All of my accounts are the same. I have one account. I have one um, Facebook account. I have one Twitter account. I have one Instagram account, one Snapchat account. Everything I have is transparent and even though I know that I would run the risk perhaps of somebody judging me for something I put up I'm very careful about anything I put up so that I know I know I have the filter to know what is right and what is wrong and being able to model that I think is a key thing for me helping to spread to my students this aspect of digital literacy. A couple of weeks ago, both Bill and Alyssa were at school. They were interviewing some of my students um, about some things about social media and we were talking. I, I stopped in during lunch and we were talking about this very idea and I would said something about, you know, I don't believe that a teacher should have two different accounts because you're a teacher 24-7 and anyway, a teacher, anybody who knows you would know you're a teacher so you can't post things about kids being, you know, lazy or something that went on in class or something that's too politically charged or something that, you know, might um, especially in our cases as Catholic educators might um, contradict something from the church or something and I was going on and on and this little girl turned and said that's not really fair you know why should teachers have separate accounts you always tell us that we should have one because our colleges and our employers are going to be able to find us no matter what and, and, and she's so right I mean out of the mouths of babes um, Another aspect that sometimes comes up with this line between professional and personal is also, you know, an arguable role that we have in educating parents. I don't know about you, but 
I'm kind of embarrassed about some of the things that my friends and family post on Facebook. I've been giving my husband heck lately because God bless his cousin from Florida who's a senior citizen just got on Facebook and um, I get on average 15 or 20 uh, messages a day, direct messages with jokes or something and so my phone is just hidden all day from notifications from her and and that's not even like that's far from the worst thing that can happen but um, as a teacher you know we're not allowed to be friends with our kids on Facebook but the minute they graduate sometimes I think they have their cell phones on their laps the kids right away start to friend the teachers who are on Facebook and I, uh, I, I accept them and then I quickly unfollow them so that I don't get to see all the things they do because you know I really don't want to see some of the things they do since they're still minors but over the years some of my um, students have grown up into fine young people and it's really really nice to be able to connect with them in that line too but I'm still their teacher even if they're 30 years you know there's always that idea that you were my teacher so not only do I think being a teacher is 24 7 but it almost is is a lifetime anyway I don't want to get stuck on that point but I just wanted to um, throw that at you to think about why we were on uh, this topic another aspect to cultural has to do with um, understanding how internet culture is expressed so it's like understanding about emojis I love emojis I could tell a story with emojis I think they're the neatest things that ever happened or animated gifs gifs I never say that word right um, memes different things like that and also um, applications so cultural literacy is about being able to adjust seamlessly to different social environments of various applications um, for example I, I, I sometimes think like um, applications online are like washers and dryers so you each one is different and has different settings but if you can operate a washer and dryer you can probably figure out almost any washer and dryer and in a lot of ways um, things that occur in one application you will see repeated over and over in the ways other applications occur and if you can't figure it out there's directions so just like a washer and dryer Another aspect to cultural literacy has to do with um, understanding a very specialized vocabulary and I'm not talking about modem or, or um, anything hardwired related but the idea of expertise you know who is an expert today and the idea of um, what does it mean to publish something and what does it mean to share something so this actually crosses over into some other areas that we're going to get into which is the idea of being able to figure out who somebody is if somebody is who they say they are online and being able to understand you know what it means to put your ideas out there so there's a lot to do with cultural liter literacy in terms of digital literacy that actually flows into different aspects. His second um, literacy is cognitive literacy or they, he calls it how to do, you know, how to do the internet and, 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 and certainly you do need a, a pretty good range of computer skills and a lot of it is sort of what I just said it's about being able to use a range of devices so if you're on an iPad or an iPhone being able to use a different version maybe the web version of that program on a Chromebook or on a regular computer or be able to go to Apple so it's about having the skills to work a range of devices, a variety of software programs, um, a variety of interfaces. Um, this cognitive how to do part also is um, a little bit what we started to touch upon in cultural which is to recognize commonalities things like you know menus like um, a menu in 
something that's on um, uh, somebody's website might look different than a menu in uh, another area. Um, Chrome has done a nice job because we kind of have gotten used to where everything is and you you know you know you see those nine dots you know you're you're hit, heading for something but not every application or every program has that same kind of feel but it's about that ability to see that you know where to go for a menu it might not be in the right hand corner it might be in the left corner or the bottom but it's this idea that there even is a menu to look for um, another thing, um, another commonality which I think is important is profiles. So it is so important that if you're going to put yourself out there on the internet that you represent who you are. Um, I still get on a friend of mine who teaches at Judge, and I'm sure somebody here is going to know who he is, um, who on Twitter still has an egg. And he's been on Twitter for three or four years. And I know that he says Gene Carboni also gets on him. Put your picture up. You know, put a profile picture. When I see an egg on Twitter, I think that's not somebody who's been on it very long. So the idea of filling out profiles. Uh, letting people know who you are. I mean, maybe you don't want people to know who you are, but if you are going to be digital literate, there is the aspect not only that you're going out and taking from the internet or from anybody online, but that you're also offering something as well. So having the idea of your picture and information about yourself and all of your handles for different ways that people can connect you are very important. Um, another part of cognitive literacy has to do with things like understanding why we would use hashtags, which ironically we found out teenagers don't use. I, I still do things in class, like I make those two finger things and I'm like, hashtag, and they all look at me, like for the last two years they've been looking at me like I'm crazy. Um, I was teaching Jonathan Swift a uh, modest proposal at the height of um, Black Lives Matter movement and I was explaining about you know how the English government really was um, not being very good at all to the Irish people so I, I, I did that little sign with my fingers and I'm like hashtag Irish lives matter and they laughed and I thought they were laughing at me for coming up with a joke but they were laughing at me for using a hashtag but most of us understand that idea of hashtags. They've just taken Twitter and have developed it into a whole different kind of application than what we use it for professionally. Um, hashtags are a way for us to identify what we're talking about and to be able to search for things. Um, tagging, uh, features like sharing, like how to share something. Um, that little, I, I love anything with that, you know, the little box with the arrow, just share it right to Facebook, right to uh, a, a convo, right to a conversation, right to an email. Um, those, finding those features, being able to do that or try to figure out how you share something, that's part of the aspect of digital literacy that he calls cognitive literacy. Constructive literacy is probably one of the most important things, um, although I, keep th I think I keep saying that about everything. So constructive literacy, he says, is how to use the internet. And that means knowing how to construct something in a digital um, environment, how to appropriate and reuse and remix content. Because that's what we do all the time. We we build upon other people's ideas. We borrow something from this, something from that. You know, everything has been being borrowed from time, uh, the beginning of time, from the time somebody first had an idea. But knowing how to use copyright, knowing what it means to be copyrighted. Um, uh, my kids are amazed when I teach them about copyright that I say that the minute that they finish that paper or the minute they finish that that project that we're doing online they own the copyright I said you don't have to have the little copyright sign the law says that you own that but unfortunately you can't assign anybody the right to use it 
because you're not 18. So then I have to explain to them that they're parents and guardians, even though they own it. Uh, they kind of find that interesting. And, and maybe it starts to sink into them that you just can't go and copy and paste something. Um, that's probably the biggest thing a lot of teachers complain about is the copying and pasting of text. Well, it's the same thing with pictures or graphics or anything. Um, it's giving, it's knowing how to appropriate, knowing how to cite, knowing how to um, legally and ethically use information or ideas or graphics that somebody else uses. Um, it, it means to understand fair use. So as teachers, you know, we like, like to Xerox things a lot, um, but even scanning things and putting them in your drive, like to understand what are the uh, opportunities that fair use really does apply and when do you abuse it. And Creative Commons, I mean, I think that's probably one of the neatest things today to be able to understand and have kids learn how to appropriate uh, information from other places as well. But that idea of attribution, of constantly giving credit to people's ideas, words, things that they've created is a very important part of constructive literacy. Communicative literacy, or how to communicate, is um, obviously about communication. Um, it is about knowing the purpose of various online tools and trying to understand, you know, how they're different or how they're similar. I, I think this starts to come in with the idea of selecting which program or application or tool best suits a particular project. There's um, a, a heuristic that we use in digital literacy. Um, it's not mine and the book is upstairs. I'm sorry, I can find it later, but it's called MAPS, M-M-A-P-S. So the idea of choosing which media is best for that particular purpose is a part of communicative literacy. Um, I try to explain to them that things like educreations or any kind of uh, program where you're showing somebody how to do something might not necessarily work to uh, propose an argument. So being able to differentiate the purpose of the work and to choose the right way to do that and to understand, oh, you know, this is a great storytelling app and that's a great storytelling app, but this, this is a better app to do something else with. It also has to do with uh, being able to understand norms and expectations. Like this is the way that people who use this program act. This is the understood and unspoken um, agreement that we have between ourselves that has to do with the way that we use this particular type of program or app. And probably more importantly, it has to do with understanding um, identity and sharing and influence and trust in digital spaces. You know, I asked I asked my class the other day how much of what you read online is true. And they know, they go, oh, like 40%. But they'll fall for anything. You know, they don't have that idea of being able to uh, find wh who you can trust and why you can trust it. And also, what you put out there, how you represent yourself. So that's all part of communicative liter literacy. It's not just about reading and writing, it's um, a lot more complicated than that. Another one of his eight literacies is, is confident, how to belong. So um, he describes that that has a lot to do with um, understanding the way the online world differs from the offline world. It has to do with when to plug in and when to unplug. It has to do with 
how do you represent yourself face to face and how do you represent yourself online it has to do kind of I guess with how do you walk the walk in both places how do you um, show who you are and what you know in different ways there's also a part about reflection uh, that part of reflection in learning in general or that metacognitive idea is what I really believe um, personally <laughs> is what cements learning so that ability to reflect on what they're learning in a digital space gives them confidence in a way that is very valuable and very real so if if the digital literacy students that I have are you know tweeting the link to their latest project then reflecting on you know what does it feel like to have somebody look at what you created um, how does how does it feel to have the idea that somebody else's eyes who you don't know um, is looking at that and how does it feel to be able to to maybe uh, influence somebody in the world about something or put your ideas out there you know so that that piece of reflection is part of what he talks about there being part of an online community is certainly part of confidence. You know, um, for years I've heard Gene talk about developing your own PLN. Uh, we were we we studied that stuff ten years ago or eight years ago, and we were with PLP as well. That personal learning network, that um, plugged-in group of people that you might never meet, but that you get to know by being part of an online community. Some of some of the most influential people who I have worked with I have never met but I have risked and taken the chance of being um, seeming stupid to to reach out to different people to ask opinions or to put my opinion in to to be able to um, develop that kind of confidence to to be able to put yourself in a position of vulnerability you know what we have to teach the kids of course to be safe online but we also have to teach them how to be able to take their rightful place in society and society today is not just something that's face to face it's being part of an online community so it makes the walls as they say of the classroom disappear and they can interact with people from virtually anywhere as can we and being part of that is kind of interesting like some of the things that are going on with Australian education are just mind-boggling and the stuff they do online blows my mind um, it's it's just so neat if you're part of a Twitter chat or or any kind of interaction where you start to meet people on a regular basis who you get to know uh, there's a, a fellow who just moved he's a retired teacher and he just moved out west and I'm we constantly DM each other on Twitter and um, you know he knows some things about my personal professional life that maybe other people don't know so um, that online community that having the confidence to know how to reach out to belong to that I'm talking with my hands and I keep forgetting where my mouse is okay another literacy is his creative literacy which is how to make something how to um, make new content how to do things in new ways using online tools and environments um, it's sometimes it's even in the idea of repurposing something the creative element is it adds value where the focus is more on the value created than the act of creating something new so um, imaginatively and creatively thinking about how we create and share knowledge using digital technologies uh, that creative literacy or even to just be in a workshop and learn or just pick up an app or just learn about uh, a program and, and and suddenly your your mind is going like oh you know I could use this exactly for that this would be a great way to do this 
and, and it, it isn't meant to be done that way, but you find a way to make that work. Um, creative literacy is also about knowing how to curate digital content to create value for readers. So it's a, 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 the ability to be able to discern what is important, what is key, what says it best for people who are um, reading or partaking of what you're creating online. Critical literacy deals with how we evaluate things and, and I do think um, that this kind of underlies many of these elements. So it's how do you evaluate everything that you read or, or find online but it's also how to evaluate everything that you put out there. So it requires critical thinking skills. It's using reasoning skills to question and analyze and scrutinize everything, um, to question everything, to, to, to look at it through a lens that, I hate to say it, but maybe is a little skeptical, you know, knows that trust is not easily won, that trust is something that has to be earned. So carefully looks at things, doesn't just jump on something because it's the next, next best thing, but looks at it, is this, is this app really worth, is, does it really do what people say it's going to do? Does it do anything? Is it just the emperor's new clothes? I mean, I, I don't know about you, but having been around the block a few times, like sometimes people get all excited about things and they turn out to be, you know, a, a, a real letdown. Um, so that's part of critical literacy is, is not only just about the applications, but it's about the content. It also is about searching effectively, how to, how to find things. So um, it's more than just typing a few words into Google, it's knowing how to do an advanced search or how to get a hit that exactly matches what you're looking for. Um, I'm amazed sometimes at, at, at certainly my students but also some of my family members who who say, oh, you know, I want to I want to find out blah 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 and I'm like, well, let's let's Google it and you know, they, I don't know, they don't know how to put the right words in the right order to figure things out. And certainly the more you do it, the, the better you get at, at doing that and you're able to find what you're looking for exactly in a much faster time frame. My big thing has to do with vetting sources. So this is a huge element in critical literacy, in digital literacy, is being able to figure out how valid the stuff is that you're reading or looking at or thinking about to distinguish credible from non-credible. So in this era of fake news, there's a lesson to be learned that this skill of vetting is not something that's just online. It's something, it's that critical eye that we have to um, look use as a lens to discover everything that we read or everything that we think, to question who's the person saying it, why are they saying it, what do they have to gain by saying it, are they showing the other side, how do they know that they know this stuff, how do we know that they know this stuff, who are they giving credit to, does somebody else agree with them? So vetting sources is something that comes, I think, a lot more naturally to us as adults than it does to young learners. And that's, that I think is probably, I, I think that's probably one of the most key skills um, that we need to look at when we, when we start talking about our kids. And the last of his eight it has to do with civic li literacy and, and in a way we've kind of crossed into this again as well. It's really about how to participate. You know, it's about, it's about how to be part of a movement. Um, we've, we've seen on the news
news what social media can do. We've seen how it can be good, we've seen how it can be bad. We've seen how it can drive uh, change and we've seen how it can drive dest de destruction, really. Um, civic literacy is knowing what the rights and responsibilities are that we have as citizens of the online world. What should we be doing? It's also how to participate in social movements as part of the democratic process. You know, having the right to have your voice heard in the right way, to be part of change. It's preparing ourselves and others to participate fully in society. So civic literacy is also part of, you know, being devil's advocate and looking at the other side. So those eight literacies are what he says are the roots of uh, digital literacy. I, I kind of think that you probably know that we're going is that literacy is really not just for ELA. Um, these digital literacies that Doug Belshaw talks about are like all literacies. They're like all content areas. They're for all teachers. They're lifelong skills. The idea of being able to know how to create something and know how to cite something and know how to vet something and know how to be able to participate in a community, these are skills that are as important, I would argue, as reading, writing, listening, and speaking. So the question is, you know, how, what do these literacies look like in your content area, whether you're math or social studies or science? Um, all of us are driven by at least the Common Core standards. For ELA, there's distinct standards, but they're the same. They're based on the same anchor standards as they are for the literacy for social studies, science, and other technical subjects. And I would argue that I would put religion in that same category. So all of us are religion teachers, but all of us are literacy teachers because all of us teach through reading, writing, listening, and speaking. And Digital literacy, if we go back to the fellow from Penn Literacy Network, is just another literacy. It's just part of being um, an educated, contributing member of society. Sometimes people get hung up in skills. You know, what's the difference between a digital skill and a digital literacy? Well, skills lead to literacy. So a digital skill is teaching somebody how to uh, put, to download an image and insert it into slides. But digital literacy is learning, is teaching kids how to choose the picture based on the message, the argument the picture makes. So uh, there's a difference between um, skills and literacies. I think this is, this is key, that digital literacy is really about critical judgment. A couple of things I'd like to go over with you are some of the things that people say um, about digital literacy. So um, one of the big things is that digital, digitally literate teachers know everything about all technology. And if that were the case, then I would have to take myself right out of the race. Um, <laughs> literacy is really a matter of problem solving. Uh, knowing what digital tool you need to use and possessing the ability to figure it out on your own. That's digital literacy. For a teacher, what matters is having enough familiarity and knowledge with different technologies so that you can find your way around them. But you can't possibly know anything. Um, it's not about the tools. It's really not even about um, tech. It's about a mindset. It's about an openness to learning to how to figure things out. It's not necessary to know everything. Digi digitally literate teachers don't need to know everything. They just need to know why. And that might sound trite, but it's, it's about literacy. What we bring to the classroom as teachers is years of creative, excuse me, critical thinking. We don't need to know 
how to make this app work. If that's what a, a kid can do that. The kids come in, they can make anything work. Uh, I'm sure Bill's kids, if they stopped walking all around upstairs, are probably sitting down with an iPad and they can probably do things on that that I could never figure out, but they don't know why it's important. They don't have the expertise. So it, the using it is not as important as knowing it. Um, some people think that you know you go into school you see technology all technology is great well it's not you know tech for tech's sake is is futile it's unproductive it doesn't mean anything sometimes it can take learning backwards um, the ability to judge what technology is right at a certain time is is much more important than um, just using technology for technology's sake some people say that digital literacy gets in the way of traditional methods. That's not true because no matter whether you use a piece of chalk or a Chromebook, it's a tool. Tech is a tool. Good teaching is good teaching is good teaching is good teaching. Best practices cross whether it's tech or whether it's low tech. Another, another myth is that digital literacy is a separate skill. And maybe you're thinking, well, Kathy said she has a digital literacy course. Yes, I do. And we have a writing skills course as well at Ryan. But they are not taught in a vacuum. So as we teach digital literacy, what we're doing is we're teaching children how to create and curate content online for all areas of the curriculum. It's sort of like um, a, just a stop for a semester and do a deep dive and let's spend some more time really making sure that we understand why this is important. Um, digital literacy is a part of all literacy. It's a part of all curriculum. Digital literacy is about communicating. Some people think that dig uh, digital literacy is all about functionality, and it's not. Functionality, um, it's not about navigating various technologies. So for teachers who are afraid because they don't feel like they're naturals at a digital environment, you don't have to worry about that. You just have to worry about letting your kids um, do that. What you have to do is you have to teach them how to evaluate sources, how to stay safe, how to think critically, how to collaborate with each other. So uh, digital literacy is not about necessarily you know, being able to explain how everything works. I think the biggest myth is that a lot of people think that because our kids grow up learning how to, knowing how to use things, almost like things are born in their hands, that they're inherently digitally literate. They're not. There's a big difference between shooting um, video on an iPhone and there's a big difference between making a movie. There's a difference between scribbling some notes on a pad of paper and writing down, writing an entire story or an essay. Um, knowing, knowing how to use the tools doesn't mean you know how to use them correctly. Common sense, safety, critical thinking, they're, they're the skills that we need to bring to our digital natives. So um, Bill, if this is okay with you and Aaron and Alyssa, it might be a good time just for a stretch break and to see if anybody has any comments or questions. Kathy, absolutely, this is a great time. Um, if anybody does or would like to ask Kathy a question, feel free to do so. If you're on either a laptop or a desktop and you see the control panel that is floating on the right-hand side of your screen, um, the little pop-out window uh, off the control panel that pops out to the left on the bottom of that, you have the ability to raise your hand, and if you raise your hand, um, I can acknowledge you and come over and give you the microphone uh, so that you can ask Kathy a question. Uh, otherwise, I believe our question window uh, was pretty quiet throughout the, um, uh, the first part of the presentation. Alyssa, Aaron, anything that, that you want to add uh, here or any comments from the, uh, maybe that came in from the question window? Uh, comments from the, the question window, just a, a lot of agreeing when it comes to the importance of that PLN and that, that connection that we have and, and just a lot of echoes 
uh, to that importance. Um, Kathy, what I might ask you, I kind of have a question. Uh, as you were talking about those different kind of modes of digital literacy in there, do you see, in your opinion, especially having a digital literacy class, do you see students struggle more with, you know, whether that be the civic literacy or, or one of those, do you see students struggle um, more often in one area than another, or do you see adults struggling more often in one area of those digital literacies than the other? I think that um, where I see my kids have the biggest problem is with the how to evaluate, so with that critical element. Um, it's like trying to put an old head on young shoulders. So the life experience and the background knowledge of how to not believe everything that you read and to know how to um, figure out if somebody has an agenda is is a skill that is not is not something that I see very well established in my students and and frankly as far as adults I would say I would think that the confident uh, literacy that he describes is probably where I see um, a, a lack of confidence how to belong how to be part of an online community how to get in there and you know, put yourself on the line and not be afraid and be willing to make mistakes and trying to figure out, you know, how does this world online differ and how is it similar from the offline world and how to capitalize on um, what, what we're able to get online. Does that make sense, Alyssa? It does, and I, I think that's really great, uh, both on the adult side to, you know, we're, we're all invested and we're taking the time here to make those connections and learn and grow, so hopefully we can take that to heart a little bit, and I do appreciate you saying that kind of the, the critical piece with students, just because I think it then follows up a lot with what you were just talking about with the myths, and really all of us in, in our respective content areas can then, you know, really use our teacher expertise to help students to be critical and it kind of drives home that that same point that it's not just an ELA piece it's helping kids to to um, be critical in all areas so it makes a lot of sense so thank you thank you okay, Kath, so it looks I, like there are, uh, there are no hands raised so I'm gonna give it back to you to uh, to continue on with your presentation I'm sure well, people we, are we ready for just, sleepy talk Oh, I'm sorry, we have one question okay. that just popped in. Go ahead, Aaron. Uh, one question. Uh, so I'm going to actually uh, pass the microphone to John. So, John, you're, you should be unmuted. You can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Kathy. Can you Hi, hear John. Me? How are you? I can. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen you. Yes. Uh, Kathy, do you teach or uh, evaluate uh, or teach students how to evaluate or judge fake news, uh, which is now very much part of our current political culture? Right, so we've just started talking about fake news this week because it dovetailed very nicely with um, where we're proceeding. I just have a new group for this semester and after getting some norms established and creating some common ground, we're moving into vetting websites. So that has lent itself to discuss a little bit about fake news because it's that same kind of critical eye. and. Um, Actually, we're planning to go a little bit deeper probably in the next week or two. Thanks, Kath. Sure. Thank you, John. All right, Kath, okay. I think it's back to you. All Thank right. you. So let's dig in a little bit about what the implications are for us. So I hope that we have a pretty, you know, good idea or at least a working idea of the intricacies of digital literacy and um, let's talk about what it means to be digitally literate um, in a teaching environment. So it really is about bringing good literacy to, to an online environment and that's why you know this idea of fake news which is in the news right now excuse me, is so important because it gives kids a real life look at uh, the problems of being able to tell what's real from what's fake. What doesn't change, whether it's a magazine or a newspaper 
or an online article is critical thinking and good sense. It's just the technology that changes, whether it's uh, something that's written one way or written the other. Um, the key is that as teachers we have to have a mindset that allows us to adapt what we bring to the table with best practices into this kind of uh, landscape that's constantly changing and evolving. So we know much more than we know. And and probably, um, I, I kind of think that maybe Alyssa alluded to this, probably I'm preaching to the choir because most of us who might join the webinars are realizing that the divide between offline and online, it's really just about it's just about a way of looking at something, but the skills, the way we take in information and the way we sort it, there are things that are alike no matter where, where we're getting our information. Probably the most important way uh, that we can embed digital literacy in our classrooms has to do with this idea of vetting. So I remember Alan November a long time ago talking about uh, that Martin Luther King site that was actually um, a neo-Nazi group and sometimes I talk about that with the kids of course I don't search it because I don't want to make it any higher up in the hits but I do explain to them how innocence and naivete can sometimes let people believe that something that looks really good looks like it's official, looks like it's real, um, can be disastrously wrong. So that idea of vetting sources, um, to look for things like when was the publication and when was the update, you know, who is the author, to Google the author, not just to even look at, you know, about me, uh, but to actually see what else you can find online about that author. What are his credentials or her credentials? Are there any other things that he or she has written? Um, to look at what kind of a website. It's sort of, it's sort of surprising sometimes how kids really see the .com, .gov, .org thing as a way of uh, vetting a source. And so I say, well, a .edu, do you think that's a good source? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, guess what? Um, kids make websites all the time at colleges that are .edu's, and I don't know if that kid is really an expert or is right about what he's saying. So the kind of website it is, um, being able to find info confirmed in other places, to see if information is linked as a resource to other. All of these skills, no matter if you're teaching science or social studies or anything, when there's research, just to take those few extra minutes and not make it a separate lesson, but to say, you know, you know, certainly you guys know who the content experts are in your world online. So to say, let's take a look at this person. Let's see who he really is. And um, sometimes I even just like, uh, I'll say to the kids, all right, give me a topic, let's look it up. And then I'll go through with them and I'll model what it is that I'm looking for to be certain that this is actually a reputable, authentic, credible source. Um, actually, I think the best thing for all of us is to be best friends with a librarian because <laughs> my librarian knows more than I could ever hope to know. Um, John, you might be interested to know that at our next uh, department chair in service we're going to go through again some of the databases that are available to us the diocese. A lot of people in our high schools who don't have librarians don't even know about all of the sources that we have. And what's really great is I think it's really important to teach kids how to vet information, but I also think it's important for them to learn that at any reputable school or college, there are going to be databases that have already been vetted that they don't have to worry about looking at if this is true or not, then the whole critical level goes to a different place. It's not about whether it's true or not, it's about whether this fits what I need to find out or how does this challenge my thinking. So um, the databases, I, I, I have found that 
um, some of the schools don't have them on their website. You can go anytime, of course, to archbishopbryan.com and go to the library and you will see absolutely everything that the diocese has. Now, some of the schools might have one or two different things that their librarian bought separately, but generally most of the databases have been purchased by uh, Mary Brailsford and by um, Charmaine Gates from Carroll, and those women know their stuff about that teaching kids how to search a database and which database to use. That is a skill that will help them for high school, for college, for their life, forever. Um, I, I think it's important, like, whenever we do research, I have the kids use half from a database and half that I make them go through a vetting process and show me that it's okay to use, because they do need to do both. They need to be able to have the luxury of relaxing and knowing that this information is not something they have to be nervous about, that they can look at it and trust it and that what they're looking at, um, what, it, what they're looking at it for is not about judging whether it's right or not, but it's judging how right it is for this particular situation. There's also a lot of pre-vetted teacher sites. One of my favorite is Procon.org. It has a zillion topics that you can give in almost any subject area. Uh, unfortunately, as does some of the databases, there are going to be things that are controversial in our church teaching that, you know, so that lends us to another discussion about things that, you know, we're not going to discuss, we're not going to look at both sides unless we're in a theology class sometimes. So, um, that whole that whole idea kids come back and from school at, from from college to visit and some of them are just shocked that they have to write papers on every subject and getting them ready for college and career requires all of us to really um, be honest about the fact it's hard to do this. This is not easy. Um, sometimes I, you know, I am not one of those people who loves index cards. I know there's lots of English teachers who do. I am not one of those people. I hate them. Um, but I do know as much as I don't like to pour through things, I do know how great it is to find those nuggets of truth that work for me. And not only do I suggest that we become best friends with librarians, but I tell my students they should all be best friends with the librarian. Um, when it comes to creating, and in order to follow copyright laws, we really do have to concentrate on citation. One of the um, great databases we have is Noodle Tools, and again, I'm not sure that everybody in the diocese knows about it, not even all the English teachers, but what's special about Noodle Tools is not that it's just a worksite generator or an, uh, an inline text generator. It teaches paraphrasing and summary skills. It helps you. There's a place in note cards where you can copy original text, then the kid can paraphrase it, then they can summarize it in their own words, and we can check. Uh, you can go online and just check on their cards that they're able to do that. Teaching kids how to paraphrase and summarize is key to everything they need to do in order to remix content. Whether it's paraphrasing a technical article or somebody's opinion about something, for somebody to represent, to use that information in a new way, they have to be able to paraphrase and summarize. Uh, Noodle Tools does, a, does lends a way to do that and of course Al Purdue, which I think is one of the best sites, um, has lots of information about that. Require documentation. Everything they do, require work cited. Um, I, I, I sometimes have them embed the hot link for the source um, right in their work so that I can click it and make sure that you know they're not copying and pasting. But we even paste work cited sometimes in the work we do just to make it um, uh, reputable, to get them used to it. They just can't go and, and take something. I don't know that I was ever taught paraphrasing and summary in high school. I think I, 
I think that we learned it on our own. Maybe we were better readers, but there's lots of great lessons about paraphrasing and summarizing, and whether it's history or social studies or music or any subject that there could be, doing it in that subject is different than doing it in English class, and they're going to need to do that for college. So. Um, if they're going to end up with a career online and they're going to be reviewing movies, they need to be able to take press releases and summarize them or paraphrase them and cite them as part of their review or whatever it is. Wherever there's a remix of content, there's a need to be able to um, accurately cite and accurately use that content. I hope that makes sense. Um, photos, graphics, videos, and more. The more kids use this stuff, great, but they have to understand copyright and creative commons. They have to learn how to um, not get the greatest pictures off of Google because they're not for free, or they're not for reuse, or they're not for non-commercial use. Um, they have to learn other sites, and there's tons of them that offer free stock photos and things that they can use for their um, Google Slides presentations. Wherever they get their pictures, they should be citing them, whether it's a free site or not. Um, the best thing is to encourage original work. So when they're doing projects, they have cameras, they can take pictures. It's amazing how a little imagination can it's not just about getting around copyright laws, it's about teaching that creativity and the ability to um, truly bring your own uh, sense of the world into your work. Cite everything. I think I think that's probably, and maybe you're thinking, oh, she's an English teacher, that's why she's saying it. Um, you know, I also have a degree in French, that was my first degree, and I had to cite everything in French. So whether, whether it's, um, uh, whatever the subject is, getting kids remixing content, getting their hands in other people's work and making sense of it and putting it together in different ways but making sure that they're doing it legally and ethically correctly. It's a lot of lees. No matter where we are, it's important no matter what subject that all of us help kids see what happens to their digital footprint. You know, um, I, I, I refuse like, I get so upset when I look at some of my Grade Connect emails from kids. Like, they still do that. I'm so hot at AOL.com or, you know, love soccer, 12, 16, what, I don't even know what year they're being born in, 92, 99. Um, and they're, give, they're still giving away their identity. They should all be using their school email. Like, their personal email has no place in our world. It's a professional world. I don't give them my personal email, which is ironically the same thing as my professional, but we've, been, we've talked about that already. But um, it's just at Comcast.net instead of ArchbishopBrian.com. Um, but they need to, they need to see that. Um, they need to establish a professional footprint. And I'm pretty sure that their school emails that we give them, their Gmails, are good for a long time. So, you know, for them to be able to use all of those, all of the features of G Suite, it's really sweet um, for having them using their school email and to use that account for their social media. It's important that we talk to them about the privacy, about you know, where where are things, where is the line drawn between what's private and what's out there? So, yes, we have Twitter accounts and we have pictures on them and we have all kinds of things, but our username is very unidentifiable. Like, it's, it's first initial, last name, it's professional, but it's not, you know, come follow me, um, a co-ed type thing. Um, teaching them about safety, teaching them about... Um, consumerism about things that are online that are good, things that are online that are bad, um, legal things, and, and above all, um, I think teach the grandma test, which I'm sure you all know is if you would be embarrassed for your grandma to see it, don't do it. Um, but that is something no matter what subject we teach that's embedded, that's, that's part of being a good person, that's part of morals, that's part of our Catholic identity. It's really about um, 
um, being able to represent yourself in a modest and um, safe way. Uh, the other thing is I think what's really good is if we start to rethink social media. Um, several years ago, um, maybe more than several, Jim Meredith was uh, pretty famous because he started a Facebook closed group with his AP government students. And so they were never friends on Facebook, but they had their private group and they did a lot of posting. The kids were into Facebook at the time. As soon as we all got to Facebook, they got out. Um, same thing with Twitter. When Jim was still at Ryan, he and I used to have Twitter Tuesdays. And every Tuesday, our kids would tweet something. Um, and then kids started to use Twitter. So that's not their place anymore. So now they're at Snapchat and Instagram. To rethink the way that that social media is used. You may say, oh, Snapchat, you know, all they do is things, you know, they, sh they shouldn't be doing. Well, if you introduce a way to story something, to make a story about something, they could have a Snapchat with their appropriate school email and school account. Um, I might be blocks. So you might have to talk to Bill about that. And they might be able to work with that. That's where they are. So when you kind of get into their world, I'm not trying to say that you ruin it for them, but then you bring life into it. You bring that critical view that this is not, if it's not something that you're willing to do, um, like sort of in that environment, of a school, then it's probably not something that you should be doing. And not only that, it also it, it catches them. Like they like to do things like that. Um, another thing, when we talked about teachers not needing to know every single app or program, best place to learn them is from the kids. I, I noticed that um, I was teasing Alyssa and Aaron and Bill about being so old. And I've noticed that one thing lately. I've not been able to learn new programs as easily as I used to. It takes a little bit more like, oh, this Snapchat stuff's a little weird. And um, but So they show me, I get it, and they feel good. I feel stupid, but it's okay. We get a bond. But meeting them where they are, that's kind of an important thing that has an impact. It also gives you the opportunity to talk about how to use these things appropriately. Um, they're not necessarily getting it from any place else. Certainly not out in social media world where um, they're seeing people do things uh, that we don't want them to be doing. On Twitter, for example, I still don't understand why any kid would want to you know, tweet that they're brushing their teeth or something like that does not make sense to me when Twitter just is so obviously a professional way of sharing information, um, but they find little hacks and ways to make it their own. Um, but it's, it's our job to show them that social media, it's not just about um, chilling, it's about interacting with people and being a community and, and there's that aspect to it as well. The other thing is is that our kids are uh, exposed to information in multiple forms so it's it's important that we teach them how to read media in different ways. So again no matter what the subject area, um, have them look at photos and video and, and look for for inferences. You know, you know, show them a video of something in your of in your topic in your content area. You know, what does what can you infer about this picture of bacteria, or what can you infer about this picture of immigrants? You know, what can you tell me about that? Um, there's a lot of infographics more than ever today, and looking at some of them are amazing. They're static infographics which don't move, there's dynamic ones which have little fun things that move, um, they're everywhere but it's amazing, it's, it's, it's amazing how our kids may not be able to translate that into actual words. Um, another thing I, I like them to do is to create their own infographics in PictoChart uh, or Canva, there's another way you can do that. So sometimes kids um, learn something better by doing it from the inside out. Close reading is what we teach. Whether we're teaching, whatever subject we're teaching with text, we're doing close reading. So 
ha having them to be able to decode digital media and closely read and analyze. Here we go with the maps again, mode, media, audience, purpose, situation. Um, it's all part of, it's not vetting for, for authenticity or vetting for um, it being credible or not. It's, it's, it's looking at media or information and trying to trying to read it and trying to understand its implications. Um, I want to get through this quickly because I know we're getting near the end of our time, but a lot of kids who take online classes don't pass them and I think a lot of that might have to do with being able to read online text. Our kids are used to reading things in little chunks. They click this, they click that, they do that. But when there's like a passage to read online, we have to teach them how to slow down, how to find things, how to find the main idea, find the supporting details, to discuss it, to reflect. We have to bring the same skills that we have for reading print to reading uh, things online. Some of the great reading tools, um, Google Docs gives you online annotation. I cannot say enough about Newzella. We have to teach them self-control. We have to teach them because so many of their courses are going to be online or hybrid. And as as it is, we we just don't want to have them have to uh, fail out of things and, and up that college co cost anymore. So the more that we have them doing things online reading, the more we're teaching them how to read online. Again, same thing, there's lots of resources for writing, no matter what the content area, there's lots of options for presenting. Um, you might not know these and you don't have to know these, but they can know them and they can figure them out. And um, I think I, this is, we're back to that about the kids teaching us, that teacher-student relationship can only be benefited by letting them help you. Um, teens know how to operate most things, but they really don't know how to, to work them through the lens of digital literacy. So just to wrap this up, and I um, hope I'm not doing short shrift here, but just because kids know how to write, it doesn't mean that they know how to write an argument. And just because they know how to read, doesn't mean they know how to read closely. Just because they know their way around technology doesn't mean they're technologically or digitally literate. The kinds of uh, thinking that, that we need, that they need, we know from the offline world also works on the online world. To teach kids to be more digitally literate doesn't mean that we have to be tech experts, nor do our students. We just have to teach them to be literate, and they will bring that lens. Um, to their life and to the classroom. And here's some interesting resources. I know Alyssa will be sending you out this presentation. There's some hot links in there. And if there's any questions, you can always email me. Um, it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate you letting me talk about um, something I'm very passionate about. And for those of you who stuck it out, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate it and I love talking about this stuff. So thank you so much and I'm going to turn it back to Bill and the gang. Well, Kathy, great and, and thank you. And um, just as a reminder, as Kathy just mentioned, um, tomorrow night just around 7 o'clock you will receive a link um, or an email with a, a number of different links. One of those links will be the direct link to Kathy's presentation. So the resources that you are viewing right now on the screen, you will be able to go in and directly click those resources um, to be able to, uh, to jump out to those resources on the web. Um, as well, you will have an opportunity to be able to complete uh, some feedback that will be popping up in the, uh, in the chat window uh, also. And that gives us feedback on, you know, both this webinar and all of our webinars. Um, Kathy, I, you know, I want to thank you. I think this is really, you know, you, you, you touched on it throughout the, um, uh, throughout the presentation. But you know, one of the biggest things and, and almost frustrations that I hear as I travel around to the schools, and I think Alyssa and Aaron would, would echo this as well, is that, you know, while our, our kids are these digital natives, but, um, but, but they know how to do certain things. They know how to do Snapchat. You know, they they knew how to do Twitter, but they don't know how to um, 
use technology to empower their learning. And, you know, I think you, you really um, emphasize that, that it's not about the technology, but it's about the literacy that sur surrounds our environment now, um, which is certainly most important. Thank you, Bill. Um, I, if there are any questions, um, again, we have a few minutes. If there are any questions, feel free to be able to, um, to hit the, the hand raise icon. And I will um, acknowledge you and come over and give you the microphone if you if you have a question that you want to be able to ask ask Kathy at this point, um, Alyssa or Aaron, uh, anything that um, that you want to be able to highlight or or, or recognize at, at this time. Uh, Kathy, I uh, I really enjoyed uh, your presentation tonight, so thank you. Um, I think one of the things that, that I struggled with in, in when I was teaching in the classroom was in the, the age of Photoshop, the fact that even images, ha you know, become, you know, you have to evaluate, is this true, is this, um, you know, valid? And, and so I guess my question is, as you are teaching your students to evaluate websites and to, to be kind of uh, curious skeptics, if you will, um, you know, what sort of criteria, how do you, uh, you, you talked a little bit about the URL address, but how do you teach them to evaluate a good website or a trustworthy website over a, a non-credible site? Well, um, I have a whole list of things that I ask them to go through, um, including looking at, you know, uh, who the publisher is, um, seeing more about the about page, when it was published, when it was updated, um, to do a little Googling about the people who are involved, um, to see what kind of um, uh, publication it's part of. Is it an online uh, magazine? Is it just um, something that's posted that's from print? Um, to look at it from the credentials of the author, to look at it from uh, perhaps even a political stance of the publisher um, and we go through all those kinds of things and then make a judgment whether it's valid or not and then and then I teach them about databases because <laughs> then they're like oh I don't have to look all that stuff up but <laughs> but um yeah it's like it's like I, I try to throw at them every possible way of being fooled into thinking something is real. You know, I haven't pulled out any Photoshop lately. That is a really good idea. That was back in John Lamb's day. We were doing a lot of Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Well, great. And Kath, thanks again um, for Everything. all... Oh, there you go, Kat. Thanks again for uh, for your time and effort in in putting together the the presentation this evening. Um, you know, certainly very grateful uh, for everything that you put into it for you know for our own professional learning. So thank you. Thank you. And just for everyone, um, again, as a reminder, you know, please feel free to connect with us online in. Uh, whatever means you feel comfortable. Um, we are across the web in all of our social media platforms, and we are consistent with our username as AOP Tech. So you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Pinterest, and Instagram. And specifically on YouTube, our list of, um, uh, of recordings and tutorials continue to grow uh, by the week. Um, as well, our official uh, AOP Tech website is aoptech.weebly.com. And for those of you that uh, use the, the great tool of Remind for uh, either in-school or classroom communication uh, between the classroom and home, join us as well on Remind at AOP Tech. And just as a final reminder, um, again, you will receive the email tomorrow night, which will contain all of the, uh, the presentation links, the resources, and the feedback um, survey. The feedback survey and some of these resources are posted in the chat window on your control panel uh, and they're available for you there now where you will receive them tomorrow night. Um, we do take the opportunity to be able to to look at all of our feedback to see how we can improve all of our offerings throughout the year and also to be able to better prepare for the offerings for next year. And the final reminder is um, if you are receiving Act 48 credit uh, and you did register on Courseware, 
Um, this will be a separate evaluation form from the AOP Tech Forum that you will receive in the email tomorrow night. That evalu evaluation form will come directly from Sister Edward, her office, and the Courseware website. So with that, um, I want to say thank you once again to Kathy and to Aaron and Alyssa for all of your help this evening. Uh, thank you everyone for your time on this Ash Wednesday evening, and I hope you have a great end to, end to the week and a wonderful upcoming weekend. Take care and have a great night.